the different teams that you're part of, assignments, uh, which are to do with class teams, um, and you have the calendar, which are meetings uh, that you have from the, our team's meetings. Um, and then you have a help section, which is uh, hugely helpful, um, uh, excuse the pun, uh, but you can um, access resources that can help you understand further about Teams, whether it's embedding apps, whether it's understanding different elements of these tools. And then we have the apps also uh, that you can embed. Uh, as you can see here, we're in the Cornerstone class uh, or Cornerstone training team, which is a demo team that we use. Um, so we have um, a number of different channels. These channels are different uh, areas where you can communicate and use uh, the different things as part of it. So we've got the general. Um, and to begin with, when we started using Teams, we started with just a general channel. Uh, but this actually got too clogged up. Um, and actually there was too many aspects in it. So we uh, included lots of different channels that you can see on the left hand side. So we had CPD, organizational, pupils, uh, social staff room, staff and teaching and learning. Um, then across the top here, uh, within uh, each of the different channels, uh, you have a file section. Um, and um, as when you create a, a team, you get a staff notebook. Uh, which will be touched on. And you can also uh, create other links in there. And this is how you see it on a mobile device, very easy and accessible um, and access all of the same different things with slight limited capability, uh, but you can uh, access the majority of the different things. So, post, a really useful tool that we have used. Um, and certainly for getting out those messages. So you can either start a new conversation uh, or you can make an announcement. We've had quite a few announcements from our caretaker recently uh, with the ice conditions. You can share it with uh, more than one channel. You can share it in multiple channels, whether it's a key message that uh, or multiple teams. Um, so we can type our message, we can select the channels that we want it to be shared in, and we can also choose whether we want replies as part of it uh, or replies disabled, whether it's a message that you just want staff to, to understand that you can turn off. Um, so, and you have, as you can see, a number of different format options. So we can insert a table, we can make it as an important announcement that people would be reminded. Uh, we can include uh, formatting options like paragraphing, uh, changing the size of the font and the text. We can underline it to make it really clear and visual. Um, and that was something actually as a staff, uh, we have started to see, uh, particularly at the beginning, we would see lots of messages if staff wanted to communicate stuff with limited formatting. But now as staff have understood and learned about the different uh, training and ways in which we can implement a toast, a post, not a toast, a uh, post, uh, we can, uh, it's been formatted and makes it much more visual for uh, both the staff, but everyone that needs to see that message. So I mentioned on the fact of the files section. So as you can see, these are two screenshots, one using the mobile app and one using the app. And you can easily access, uh, create folders. You can sync these folders with your desktop. Um, and also we can um, access um, all the necessary documents that you need. So under general, we have these different documents that staff uh, can freely access and obviously can edit uh, all at once. Um, we can uh, element of uh, access that multiple staff can uh, access and easily freely use. Um, and it means that actually we have that one stop place uh, that we know that all the latest documents are saved on there. We can also go through the history of a document and see the version history. So if there is an element that actually a document has slightly changed or there's been a mistake made with a document, we can look back through the version history of the document and actually go to previous versions to see how it's possibly changed, which actually is a useful thing sometimes with planning aspects. I can look back and see what things have been changed over planning if multiple people are using the document. Um, we can also upload documents um, and 
upload a wealth of different things, whether it's PDFs, whether it's videos, and having that one central place where they are all stored. So here's some examples of some posts that we have uh, used as part of Teams. Uh, we've got here the ICE update, uh, which was shared from our caretaker. And as you can see, uh, he's actually posted it from his mobile um, as he was actually clearing the ice that morning. Uh, but you can see that he's labeled it as an important announcement. Um, and he's able to even use the basic formatting tools when posting that announcement. Uh, so then actually all staff were alerted on their mobile devices or would see it if they were to open up Teams. Um, and straight away have that awareness of actually we need to be careful when walking into school because it could well be icy. And also for actually for teaching staff, we would be able to understand as to whether which way children would come into school because we have a different way that children come in if it was icy conditions. Uh, there's also another one at the bottom there, the parents evening. Uh, so Tim has shared the fact of uh, when we would like to do parents evening, so shared a form. So he shared a link uh, that can easily be filled in and accessed um, and really easy to communicate that message through that, uh, that all staff can easily, all the staff that need to can access that. So we have as part of our staff team, the teaching team, uh, within that, which has our planning, it has all of our data and resources. And Tim posted that in the teaching team channel because actually only the teachers needed to see that as part of uh, parents evening. I don't think the support staff wanted to lead a parents evening. Um, and actually it didn't need to go in the general channel uh, for everyone to see because that just clogs up uh, that channel and means that people have to try and decipher what is for them and what necessarily isn't for them. Um, as part of our learning, I touched on earlier that we do a Monday mini CPD. Uh, to begin with, our mini CPDs uh, would go in the general channel and be posted so that all staff would straight away see it when they log into Teams or access from a mobile device. But actually through conversations that we had, we worked out that actually the most efficient way and the best place to put that would be on the CPD channel because actually now we know that they all of those posts uh, regarding uh, Tim's money uh, money Monday mini CPD can be accessed. Uh, hopefully, it does provide some money as well. Um, can be accessed really easily. Um, and then just an example at the bottom um, of something uh, with our admin staff um, are using it to uh, support. Um, our day-to-day -day ongoing and smooth running across the school. Uh, we had, I think this was probably more than likely for census day, that we swapped our meals around uh, so that hopefully more children had some school dinners. Uh, and as you can see there, it, the message was communicated, communicated that Thursday was quesadilla um, or fish and chips. So actually we could, uh, through uh, parents, were alerted through our uh, text to parents uh, system and also staff were alerted through teams and, and made it accessible um, and meant that those key messages were recorded and shared. So uh, here's further examples of, as you can see uh, on the left hand side, about how we have uh, broken down our staff shared team. So we have our general channel, uh, which uh, is automatically created when uh, you create a staff team. And uh, this was where we uh, located and uh, put all of our folders and files uh, from our server uh, onto. And one thing really interesting question that sometimes uh, Tim and I get is actually, um, who were the people behind that put all of your files from the server onto Teams? Um, did you have an IT support company or did you have someone? Actually, we were the ones that did it uh, because actually then that meant we knew what was going to go on there. The reason partially why we moved, uh, moved from our server to Teams was actually we had so many files and folders uh, that even Tim had tried to put in capital letters and different aspects to make them clear that they were the most important ones, that actually we wanted to slim that down. Not every folder and, fi uh, and file was actually being accessed or needed to be accessed all the time. 
So by us moving those folders over, it meant that we had much more control. So we started with that general. And once, uh, once staff had got their uh, feet under the table and understood about the general channel um, and also about the files and also, uh, we then uh, created a load more channels uh, to challenge staff further um, and actually work more efficiently. So actually we know now that if there we are uh, thinking about some interventions that we want uh, some children to use, or we want to understand about different interventions, that we go to the SEND channel. If it's the fact that we found something funny that we want to share with staff to uh, communicate with, or whether it's an element that actually we want to share that there's cake in the staff room, we share that on the social staff room, uh, because then uh, that particular post fit and match different elements, whether it's CPD, uh, whether it's teaching team support staff, um, also with that. Um, so that element has supported that streamlining and meant that we have much more focused posts uh, within each of the different channels. Each week, Tim will post in the church school channel um, our collective worship theme and uh, the different activities that we can do within our class. So then at the top uh, image here, we've got uh, under general, we've got an, uh, a plus icon that can be used to add in uh, different apps, but also websites. So you will see uh, at the top, we've got posts, we've got the files that people can access, we've got the staff notebook that is created, but also we've got calendar. So we moved all of our calendar over to Teams and using Office 365 uh, as part of our Outlook for our calendar. And staff can easily either use that link or use the Outlook app to access the calendar. We also have other links in there, whether it's links to a Word document, whether it's links to uh, Microsoft Learn uh, that staff can take further CPD with. And you can see the number of different uh, things that you can add uh, to the top of your toolbar also, websites, Word documents, Excel. Uh, we've got uh, document libraries, PowerPoints, uh, an endless uh, that you can embed into Teams, which means that all staff can easily access, um, and it means you can highlight aspects that you want to, uh, that you want staff to use all the time. So for example, I know under the general channel uh, is the laptop and iPad booking timetable, so that uh, staff can easily access all of the time and easily book out laptops and iPads. One thing that was obviously also really important was the promotion of uh, quiet hours. So quiet hours is a function within Teams that you are able to uh, turn off the notifications that you get. That was one conversation that we had that actually, because of support staff moving to Teams and having access to login, actually sometimes there may be messages communicated at times that uh, sometimes we don't necessarily want to be notified at those times. So by using quiet hours, uh, you are able to disable that you don't get notifications uh, when you're active on your desktop. So for example, uh, if you are working on a laptop and a Teams notification goes off, sometimes or often it will go off on your phone as well. You can turn it off so it just goes off on your desktop when you're working on a computer. Uh, you're also able to uh, set quiet hours, whether it's days or uh, whether it's times. So whether it's the fact that you don't necessarily want notifications happening during the uh, weekend that you can turn it and set it to Saturday and Sunday, or you can set it that after 7 p.m. Uh, at night, you won't get any notifications. Um, and this meant, and I know that a number of staff have it set in school, that means that they're not necessarily bombarded at times that they don't necessarily want to be. So we're constantly thinking about that well-being for staff and how they, uh, what was best uh, to support them and actually not necessarily getting uh, bombarded with messages. And actually by using Teams, uh, we have less communication via email. Uh, as, as a whole staff, uh, more communication is happening via Teams. 
Um, obviously, our emails are still being used for whether it's uh, communicating with other schools, whether it is sending documents off to, uh, whether it's uh, uh, SEND documents, whether it's communicating with parents also, we would use uh, our emails as part of that. But our Teams has enabled uh, greater communication through the chat function, but also uh, whether it's communicating key messages, uh, whether it's risk assessments, whether it's staffing changes, whether it's actually sometimes small messages as just of checking whether the hall is not being used in the afternoon uh, by other classes. Um, and that actually you can go in there and use it as part of a PE session or additional session that you can use. Um, so Teams has really supported that st streamlined uh, working. It has supported uh, our accessing documents all in one place. We, uh, I know that uh, if we were to access data or the factor of other phase leaders or other mass leaders uh, are able to access the latest data at the time um, and not necessarily worry that that's not the uh, data journey that should be up on uh, Teams because we don't have that worry anymore. Also, the factor that we can access the documents all of the time. Um, I think one thing that because so many memory sticks were being used, was because actually we couldn't access the server so easily at home. But now by using Teams, all of those documents can be easily accessed at home and uh, easily accessed, uh, whether it's uh, working on uh, certain documents that need to be uh, produced or finished as part of the learning. So uh, a huge benefit as to how Teams has transformed our staff organisation um, and supported that communication. Um, please feel free to ask any questions at all as to uh, support with Teams, um, and I will do my best to answer any questions. Are there any uh, questions? I think just to pick up one of the questions in the chat from my side, the, the, the amount of space does somewhat depend upon your Microsoft licensing. So usually it's one terabyte per organization plus 10 gigabytes per license purchased. But with uh, with Microsoft education licensing, that's free or the license that you might agree to. You can get additional space, but I haven't really come across schools that have run out of storage space. It's not a thing unless you're going to get crazy about putting large media files in there, which you don't tend to do. You're not going to run out of space. Um, uh, as the Henry, questions start questions. flying through. Um, so um, touching on the restricting allowing access for certain people. Um, so we started off with one team that was staff shared um, and that meant that all staff could access. Uh, but now, actually, if you look at Tim's team's desktop, um, it is a uh, absolute uh, minefield of teams uh, because he has got a number of different teams, whether it's SLT, whether it's the leadership team. And all of those teams have just certain people that can access it and their their own document spaces for documents for just those people can access. So, for example, our uh, senior leadership team has four members as part of it and they are the only four that can uh, access it. Thank you very much, Tim, for your screenshot. And there is an example of uh, Tim's teams that he has access to. Uh, so we've got staff, we've got SLT, a range of different things that he can access, including uh, two which are our, our class teams as part of it. Um, embedding the calendar from Outlook to Teams, a very good question. That. Uh, that was not necessarily um, the easiest and something um, that I'm hoping Microsoft are going to work a bit more on as well. Um, but the link at the top of our um, uh, general channel is just an access of link to access the calendar online. Um, we found that the best way that staff can access the calendar is through the Outlook app. So uh, we uh, we had the factor of them using Teams to access the calendar, uh, but sometimes actually then it takes them to a separate window to log in. 
uh, but actually by having the app, uh, the Outlook app, they can see the school calendar also in their calendar as well as their own personal calendar. Um, um, that's a good question, Sebastian Stewart, regarding did staff move all internal communication naturally? Um, I don't know whether, uh, Tim, you'd like to come in on this, but I would say yes, it did just naturally move over. I don't think there was any point at which we said it had to be moved over. Um, I think it just naturally did. Yeah, and I think the it's a really good question, and it, it is about that sort of evolution. Um, we still use emails, obviously, predominantly for external. Uh, so if we're getting emails sent in and we're replying to them, uh, so sometimes you might, if you get an email in from someone external and you need to share that with three or four other staff, you might just send it on as an email. But for most of the internal things now, uh, we use uh, Teams either for posts or chat. Uh, and that's because people have got access to it so much more quickly. And I think there's also that uh, there's a slight uh, less degree of formality uh, as well as speed. And therefore, it is. It feels more like a social media platform, but is obviously controlled by us as a school. But it does mean that you know messages about changes of lunch or messages about take care when you're uh, on the ice because it's icy conditions. If you sent that by email, well, probably two thirds of the staff might not check that before they came in and slipped up. Whereas on Teams, they'll get the notification and they'll see it almost immediately. So it's it's allowed. It's it's speed. It's ease it's um, that informality uh, and therefore I think actually most staff internally prefer it. Um, and touching back to that calendar question that I just thought of another thing, uh, we created the calendar on a shared uh, Office 365 login. So we have a, a email which is um, our DFE number and calendar at cornerstoneprimary.hance.sco.uk and that means that actually if uh, a member of staff was to move on or something and that uh, and their account was deleted it wouldn't affect the whole school calendar so by linking it to no member of staff it meant that it could be easily accessed um, and then uh, that calendar has been shared with each of the staff that they can access um, regarding uh, teams etiquette um, I think that comes through our code of conduct but also our accessible use policy. Um, and actually that's, um, I think it comes down to professional judgment as well as to what things are sent via email and what things is uh, effective communication for uh, via uh, a Teams conversation. Um, uh, and um, our, regarding lost, I don't think we've, uh, I think we there's a variety of different things we use with task, understanding that we uh, must complete the task. Uh, we just started implementing using Microsoft Planner this year. And Microsoft Planner is a tool that you can uh, record all the tasks that need to be set and you can assign them to different people. So for example, as part of our leadership team, we have a number of different tasks that are to be completed each half term and term. Uh, so whether it's book looks, whether it's monitoring, um, and that's a way in which we've been able to keep track with tasks um, like that. There could be reminder or also emails sent out from staff, whether it is our Senko that sends out an email saying, don't forget that we need to, and that will be usually as a Teams message in our teaching team uh, for them. Uh, Tim, you've got a point to touch on it as well. Yeah, thank you, Henry. Uh, just coming back to that question from Clara again, I think um, as with, so we moved over to uh, CPOMs for our safeguarding about three or four years ago. And on occasions, as a head teacher, you just have to have a one to one conversation with some saying, actually, what you've written there is opinion or, you know, remember, this could end up in court. So actually, how how should we perhaps rephrase that? You know, I think it's similar in terms of that you know etiquette, whether it's email or Teams is that occasionally, and it is very occasionally, fortunately for us, uh, you have to have a conversation with someone saying, you know, was that appropriate? How might that be potentially misconstrued? Um, it is a good point about um, emails and Teams and not get lost. Um, I think your search bar in both Teams and uh, in your email is, is your best friend. 
because there are a number of times when I go, I know I've been sent this, I know who sent it to me, but did they do it on Teams? Did they do it on email? I'll pick which one I think is most likely, click in the search, and if it doesn't come up there, I check the second. So uh, search bar, I would definitely say, helps make sure that messages are easily retrieved. And your question, Lisa, regarding scheduling sending, I know that is something that is in the pipeline of Teams. Uh, obviously, you can schedule send an email. Um, I know certainly I've seen something that's it's certainly a feature that is coming to Teams because people are desperate to be able to send messages, uh, but not instantly at a time they want to. Um, If there are any other questions, please feel free to pop them in the chat. Uh, we will be moving on in a couple of minutes on to uh, the use of OneNote. Thank you, Henry, for that. That's a really informative session. It actually picks up a lot of the general areas that people are often wondering if they're dipping their toe into Teams and they haven't yet thought about it. I know certainly from the schools I've ended up working with it's one of the hardest things to visualize at the beginning is just how to structure your teams let alone the channels within the teams and then manage the memberships of who are owners and who and so forth but it is well worth spending time thinking about before rushing into it because it's harder to undo the mess than it is to um, carefully build it slowly and let it evolve over time um, and just touching on that point Lisa I just found it that actually uh, the next month it's starting to roll out across uh, the world. Um, now, when I say the next month, that could take a few months for everyone to get it or certainly a few weeks. That's all right. We're still using clunky email at the minute. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll stick with my schedule send for the time being until I've thought about it a bit more. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm always aware whenever you hear one of the presentations from Microsoft, they say that the reason they didn't add it initially was because that they felt that Teams should be quick, short, punchy messaging that needs to get there almost instantly. And their, in their vision is not to have a delay, although they do accept that people aren't always in front of their teams when they want to send one. So I think they, they have agreed to, yeah, to bow to that and put it in. I think uh, it's, just, okay. it's just, yeah, it's just about when you're working, isn't it? If I'm working on something on a Sunday, I don't want to send that out to all of my staff on a Sunday. So I'll do it when I've got the time to do it. But then I schedule send it for, you know, Monday mid morning or, or whenever it is. So that's that was the, the question, I guess. Yeah, I'd be exactly the same. I'm always really cautious about contacting people outside of working hours in work-life balance. So it, in my opinion, it's a no-brainer that we have it there, but I just don't think they've seen the importance on the Microsoft side yet, but I, we'll get it. Okay, I, it's, uh, the next workshop is beginning at 12, and at 12 o'clock it's Fran. So I think, Fran, you are with us, aren't you? He says, trying to find Fran. Hello, Fran. So I, I'm just going to hand across to Fran, and Fran is going to be introducing a session that's going to be all about teaching with OneNote. So I'll let Fran explain more. Thank you very much, Fran. Thank you. Um, I just want to check, is Henry, are you controlling the presentation? Fabulous. OK. Um, so yeah, well, well, hello all. I hope you've all been having a good day. My name's Fran, and I'm yeah going to be talking to you a bit about OneNote. Um, so I kind of, in terms of OneNote, all the technical side of things has all, all been prepared by Tim and Henry, but obviously we're using it as staff all the time now. Um, so OneNote's a digital note-taking app, and it can be accessed from your laptop or from a mobile device. Um, it means that you can work in a private space um, with your own notes, but it also um, has the flexibility that you can collaborate and work on things with other people on shared pages so we're using it in both ways in school which is perfect for us um, it seems that the possibilities with OneNote seems to be growing all the time so i definitely am discovering stuff all the time that i can new things that i can use with it and i definitely haven't discovered the, the, the maximum that it can do 
Um, it enables you to embed a range of media, so PowerPoints, photos, links to websites, videos, um, and lots more. Like you can, you know, we've been doing things like our CPD notes, shared planning, teaching inputs, to-do lists, assessment records, and lots more. So it's now um, just a really in, like embedded part of our day-to-day -day routine, really. So um, next slide, please. So when we first were introduced to Teams um, and OneNote, we were accessing it through Teams. So along the um, bar at the top um, of your team, there's a notebook tab. And so we were accessing it through that initially. Um, and lots of schools use this route to, to get onto their OneNote. So it looks a bit like this when you are in Teams. Oh no, that's great. You can go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, it looks a bit like this when you're in Teams. So you go to the notebook uh, tab along the top and click on the little arrow, and then all of your folders and pages will appear from there. But in our school, we've all migrated to using, rather than using it in this way, we've more migrated to using it through the OneNote app, which the next slide shows you a little bit about what that might look like. Yeah, this was something that we definitely like a few people started using and then saying, oh, look, I really recommend you all download the, the OneNote app because actually it does seem to be a lot quicker and smoother. And then you can keep your Teams folders um, open as well and not have to be jumping from one to the other. So definitely for us, the app has been the way forward. Um, and um, as much as some people might not want it on their mobile device, actually for us, we've then all been able to download the app on our phones and it just means that it's just so much more flexible and easy to use so for example i can just take a photo of a piece of work perhaps on my phone add it onto my page on my phone on my one app and then that appears on my laptop and on my board for the children to see so i almost have started using that like a bit like a visualizer because you can do that so instantly but also it means that when we just want to check something or add something and you've not got your laptop in front of you we can just do that on our phones really simply and easily so um yeah oh the app's definitely what we're using a lot more um yeah on to the next slide please So obviously, like when we first were introduced to this, it was when there was a lot of uh, remote teaching going on and lots of us were working at home for some of the time. And there was that sort of hybrid learning going on. And we were also starting to like do virtual CPD for the first time. Um, and it meant that what we started doing initially, sort of my first experience of using OneNote for digital note taking was actually for recording notes from CPD events. And what's quite good is that, you know, I could add those and then other people could access them and see them in the shared folders. I could keep them in a private folder if I went, if I wanted to. But for most of the CBD, it was stuff that actually we wanted the rest of the staff to share and be able to access so they could see the links or perhaps, you know, passwords to get into certain accounts and things. Um, but it also meant that if several of us went on the same CPD event, what we can do on OneNote is you can be simultaneously contributing to that. So somebody, um, Tim loves uh, snipping uh, the slides and adding them so we all can rely on Tim if he's in your CPD event. Um, but, um, you know, I could be jotting down notes and bullet points and then actually almost uh, like Tim and I have done CPD together where perhaps we've almost ended up having a conversation while listening to the CPD through the OneNote, which has been really good. So that being able to add to it at the same time in live has been really, really useful. But also I found that by doing my digital note taking in, in there means I've not got lots of paperwork around to sort into folders and things. And that's already there, which is really great. But also when we're then disseminating that information to staff at a later date, perhaps leading staff meeting or speaking to support staff, we actually almost end up using our OneNote page as the presentation at times. Sometimes that's not always the, the most suitable tool. Sometimes PowerPoint works better, but actually sometimes we use the OneNote. So it's kind of saves you doing two jobs, 
writing notes and then preparing them to share. It actually is all done in one. Um, yeah, so I think for us, that was kind of our first step into doing that. So if you could go on to the next slide. So as you can see down the left hand side, we've got um, a collaboration space which is um, divided into all these all these folders and then within those folders we've got lots of other subfolders and then even sub pages for those so you really can have lots going on in those folders um, and they're really easy to navigate around so um, as well as perhaps using this as a digital note taking tool for cpd events also when perhaps we've read a document so on the english lead and um, the lovely long document in the summer came out from the DfE, the reading framework. And so I sat there, you know, read those 100 pages or whatever and summarised for myself, but also for others, the main points of, the, of, of, of that article. And then was able to, to say, well, look, if anyone is interested and wants to see my notes rather than reading the whole document, they can. But then I also took the highlights from that and made them into a more digestible piece to share with staff because time time is precious but i have found that really it's been really really useful for that sort of thing that actually people are accessing notes from you know last year and saying oh i know someone went on a course on that i can go and see their notes in there it just is a, almost a quicker way to do that than trying to go through folders and files and things um yeah it's just i think just making us a lot more organized and um, it's just much clearer. So for us, we're definitely doing lots of that now in OneNote. Um, on to, oh, if you go to the next slide, thank you, Henry. So for me, sort of since September, I've now been using OneNote and a lot of the staff have been for our collaborating with our teams in schools so and not just using for like sort of almost private um, digital linking, but actually for um, sharing and collaborating with our team. So we work within phases in our school. So each phase now has their own um, shared collaborative OneNote page and then all the subfolders in there. So this is an example of one. So I'm a um, Key Stage 1 leader and we've got there, you know, a science folder and then all the lessons that um, in Key Stage 1 that we'll be teaching in Autumn 1. And so actually the person that we sort of take, you know, share out that planning so it means that we can it can all be accessed in the same place and all the links are there all the photographs or videos and things can all be embedded into that space um people are putting planning on there so um i was talking to one of the teachers this morning and she's kind of got the planning as that top one and the top sort of folder and then all the lessons underneath so it's so organized and easy for anyone to come along and pick up who's got access to that OneNote page and see well what's the next lesson here um yeah so we're actually using this as our like digital ink space instead of um well we are still using powerpoint at times but we used to use a lot of active primary flip chart which i'm sure some of you um have use and it's great for lots of things but we're finding that we're able to do lots of the things we were doing on that within OneNote, and it's organized in this way and can, and can be collaborated on so actually for us, some of us, it was a bit like, oh, this is a, a bit different way of doing it. But now the children are seeing us using it all the time. And the sort of theory behind that is that actually if they're seeing us use it and they know how to use it, watch us doing the tools and things. Children pick up things like that very quickly. And it means that then for Key Stage 2, who are doing their home learning on OneNote, hopefully they're going to get more capable and confident using it because they've observed their teacher. We know, especially in like the younger year group, they like to copy their teachers. So um, hopefully they're taking that all on, on board and then it will be easier for them when they get introduced to it later. We, Because we are collaborating and sharing this within our teams, sometimes obviously we want to like, brilliant, uh, sometimes we want to, um, you know, be writing on it and things. And actually that wouldn't work if say year three had written on the, all over the page and then year four come to it with all of the year three's ideas. That's not really going to have the same impact. So it is great on here that if you right click on any of your fault on your pages, you can move and copy them to anywhere. So you can say, actually, I just want to duplicate this page twice. So one page for one class, one page for another class. And this is also where you can 
uh, make sub pages so you can you know have a subject like science and then have all the lessons as sub pages underneath but there's obviously lots of tools there that you can um, play around with and they're all kind of very similar to lots of the um, you know, things that we would use in Word um, anyway so it's not too hard to get your head around taking a little bit of playing but I think we're kind of all there now it's pretty embedded uh, on to the next slide please Thank you. So one of the really great things about uh, OneNote, especially within with our lessons and our teaching, is that we can embed like a huge range of media into the pages. So you can insert a form and get that feedback straight away from the children. You can insert YouTube links and have that play immediately within the page. Um, you can insert sways, you can insert links to many websites. Adobe Spark, if you, you know, we haven't really used that loads, uh, or Flipgrid links. Uh, I won't pretend I've done all of those things, but the possibilities are almost endless. Um, and we've used lots of these um, as in, uh, embedded within our OneNotes. And it just means that it's more interactive, but it's also all there because sometimes I think, you know, I think you probably feel my pain that you end up flipping between lots of different tabs at the bottom of the page. And this means that you have to do that less, I would say, because it's all in the in the right place. Uh, on to the next one, please. So uh, these are a couple of examples in inputs and lessons where perhaps I've embedded that. So we've been doing um, our learning quest all about the Titanic. And so I've got um, videos there that are embedded within the OneNote page from the lesson. Uh, we've got little videos of um, B-Bots being used with questions next to it. So, um, discuss and provoke discussion with it with the children but actually being able to put those in there just is a prompt when you're teaching but also it means that you're not having to go elsewhere for it or click um don't know if anyone you know we've got youtube unblocked but it does mean that you have to do a bit of a mute and a skip ad before you know they get asked something strange like grab you know talk about grammarly or something um so yeah it's great to be able to have that embedded in there i would say and they and you know it might be that I haven't discovered this yet. They are quite small, the YouTube videos in OneNote, but um sometimes you don't need it to be huge, but that might be something that kind of eventually changes, but something that I haven't worked out yet. Um, what else can you do? Uh oh, if you could go on to the next slide, Henry, thank you. So you can like if you look here at these tabs, so along the top, we've obviously got like your home button, um, tab, which is really, really similar to like perhaps what might be in Word. But then in insert, you can see that you can insert tables, you can place files, so you can place planning, you can place a PowerPoint into there. And it could be that you just click on it within the OneNote page, or it might be that it actually you can get the whole thing, just every slide to be shown. And then you can be, you know, annotating it and things in class. You can um, insert pictures, online videos, links to things. All along there, you can see there's lots of uh, possibilities, including forms. And then in the draw tab, um, this has been like quite nice this year to explore that. And the children quite like getting involved, saying, "Oh, choose this color, choose this," because um, you can you can choose any like pen or ink that you want. You can have highlighters, but you know it's quite they quite like that you can choose a pen that's rainbow or galaxy colored um and you know just it sometimes makes it something like a spelling lesson that bit more exciting to have a galaxy colored pen doing the inking you can make shapes um and use a ruler and there's some math functions on there as well and then there's the view tab which is something quite new for me that i've been exploring you can change the page color we know that sometimes children um such learners in your classroom particular backgrounds are more um beneficial to them so sometimes putting like that pale background or a buff color rather than white can be really useful and there's ruler lines so you can you know if you're modeling handwriting or something or you want it to look exactly like it does in the exercise book you can choose um those grid lines or ruler lines so uh, i think the next slide is just a, like a quick uh one minute demo of that so i've tried clicking on these different things Now it may, it's not playing for me, but it might be that. All right, 
Oh, there we go. So it's just showing you really, these are all the things in the insert. You can insert your videos, insert links to other websites so you can go straight there. You can add audio, record audio in there. So this is the drawing, choosing different pen styles, different colors. Choose it, yeah, just a mini model there of the galaxy. You can tell I'm a fan. <laughs> the highlighting tool, you know, erasing and things. Um, getting different shapes up. So if you perhaps are used to perhaps using something like Active Primary, you know, there's lots of similarities, things you can do, changing that page color, changing the ruler lines, the grid or, cause that's just like our mass book. So yeah, that is a bit of a whistle stop tour around sort of the positives from OneNote that um, we found or that I found. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's quite limitless possibilities, I think. And I think there's definitely more for me to discover. But um, yeah, thank you. I think uh, I think uh, we're happy to answer questions, but I might back some of them back to Tim and Henry. Thank you, Fran. That's really appreciated. And great to see so much of what you're already doing with OneNote. Um, Tim, Henry, is there anything you wanted to add to that? I've got one thing I was going to add, but otherwise I'll let you both go first. Uh, I think the only thing I possibly might add, and if we're still looking at the screen, is in that view tab, you've got Immersive Reader. Um, apologies, Fran, if you mentioned it. I was too busy adding stuff in the chat. Um, but the fact that Immersive Reader is built right in there, uh, you know, if you've got a child who is struggling with some of the reading, uh, it can open up in that. It can be read to them. You've got a picture dictionary in there. You can use it as a teaching tool in terms of highlighting nouns, verbs. Um, and so there's, there's a whole range of things and it's built right in there. That would be the only thing that I would add, but how yeah, much so, you covered in 20 minutes, yeah. Fran, was impressive. I think the, um, the others might use that more because I'm in Key Stage 1 and my learners are not using OneNote themselves. That hasn't necessarily been something that we've needed to use, but um, I know that in the Key Stage 2 they have been using that. I think the feedback I've had from schools quite often being where you are at Cornerstone is that they feel really connected as well because certainly we're talking in key stage two more than uh, key stage one or early years is that they can get to the learning that's been taking place in the classroom anywhere and from home and I've, I've often had feedback from how positive parents feel about being able to see what's been done in lessons with the teacher and then that's been insightful to supporting the school with completion of homework or learning taking place outside of school so definitely i know it's come across with everything that's been said this morning but that access from anywhere element of the permeates through the whole of 365 is so powerful and not to underestimate it for various reasons whether it's governors parents staff pupils and so forth it, it works in all different directions one of the things i was going to pick up on and i know when you mentioned page backgrounds i often get questions myself is that in the wonderful world of OneNote, OneNote class notebook microsoft hasn't yet unified its offering so there's one note that comes in windows 10 there's one note that you can get in the desktop version of Office that you can install. And there's one note is what's called a web app, which opens up as a tab in the web browser. And they don't all, they have a lot of features that are common, <clears throat> but they don't all have every feature. So page backgrounds is one that you can only get, for instance, in the OneNote Windows 10 version or the, or the Office version. It's not available in the online version. There's a couple of subtleties there where people get so frustrated and send me messages saying, Martin, you showed me during training that I could change the background and I can't find it. There will be a few differences. Again, as Henry said, uh, linked back, we we're discussing earlier with developments in Teams. I've been assured that the roadmap is to unify it into one product. So in the long term, there will only be one version of OneNote, but at the moment we're sort of in this weird place where there's few differences between them. Thank you very much, Fran, for doing that. I appreciate you giving up time to come along as well, but it's so valuable to get the insight of someone that's using it on the ground. Are we okay to start the next session with Tamara early or do we need to have a pause to for you I can see you here Tamara but I didn't want to presume that you were ready to go I just wanted to yeah, check no, you I'm, all right I'm here, ready to go um, that means you've got 40 minutes tomorrow sorry you've got 40 minutes now <laughs> yeah I'm a bit yeah well whether I can eke it out 40 minutes who knows probably not um <laughs> Henry I'm happy to go when you're re ready to go on to the next slide that would be fabulous thank you
so I teach year six at Cornerstone um, and have done year five and six all the way through my teaching journey. Um, and I started experimenting with Sway last year, actually in lockdown. So the first Sway that my class produced was collaborative and they did that um, between them in lockdown um, from home. And then we've since brought that into school. Henry was using it a bit before me in school and I kind of thought, oh, I like the look of this. I want to get on board with what he's doing. Um, and so utilise some of the training that Henry had given us and some of the bits and pieces Tim had showed us and kind of started my journey with Sway there. So it is a form of digital storytelling and it can be used really with any age group because it is really accessible for the children. Um, you can really easily add media into Sway. So you can start with the basics of just pictures, but actually you can then go further and add videos. And actually, even in lockdown, my class added a form um, last year. And after my class in school this afternoon, I'm actually at home isolating, but they're going to be working on Sway this afternoon in school. So I'm going to give them a virtual input and then hopefully they'll send me through some fab Sways from today. Uh, next slide then, please, Henry. Thank you. So when you're creating a sway, you can start from one of two ways. You can either start with a blank sway and it's all yours from the taking, or you can start with a document. And actually, I've experimented with both. Um, I recently got the position of phase leader, same as Henry at Cornstone, and my application form I actually produced as a sway. So I wrote it as a Word document and then I converted it into a sway because I had a number of kind of links. Uh, little videos and bits and pieces that I've done in school that I wanted to add to the application and it was a really easy way of formatting and presenting it but I've done the same with the children they've written up writing in word and then they've gone start from a document chucked the word document in there and it's formatted it directly into a sway equally they've done it from the other point of view where they've started with a blank sway and um, when creating sways some it does some of the formatting for you which makes it really clear for you to then have the same formatting the whole way through you don't have to waste time looking at those formatting devices and it's a really easy way to kind of share the information without you having to focus necessarily on too much of the design element all the sections are made up kind of in those boxes so in the right hand picture Essentially, you just press the plus sign every single time you want to add something and then you can add headings, images, stats, which can be groups of pictures, various different forms of media and you can embed sways within sways as well. So I was talking to a colleague this week, actually my partner teacher, she's made lots of sways with her class and she said, I need to get these all into one. And I said, oh, actually, you can just make another sway and put all three or four of your sways that the little groups have made into one that way. So we looked at that. Next slide, please, Henry. So this is a quick little video and it's actually a video that I shared with my class last year. So I just sent this to them whilst they were working remotely and showed them how they would add sections. So you can see you press the plus, add your heading, type it in, press it again, add some text, type that in. And at this point, I just wanted them to get used to adding text and adding images. So I was just showing them how easy it was to add text to look for an image, type in what they wanted to look for, add that image in. <coughs> Should have got this on there. And actually then they could just press play and hopefully see what that sway looked like just with what they'd done there. And obviously in this one, I was just adding small bits of information. <coughs> now I'm having a cough with it. And then they went back to um, being able to edit again. So this was just a really, really clear way of them being able to add information quite easily and me being able to show them how to do that. Next slide, please, Henry. <coughs> so in terms of the designing then, again, Sway is really straightforward. There's a number of different designs you can choose from, but with each design, you can choose whether you want it vertical, horizontal or as slides. So we've talked about in class, actually, when children are presenting information, do they want a huge long text or do they want it in bite sized chunks that can go next to each other a bit more kind of like a PowerPoint in structure? So we've used it to think about our audience. Tim creates all his newsletters on Sway, so creates those so they are that vertical design and sharing all that information. And you can also look about how you want to figure out with text and with those images as well. You can customise your font. 
you can customize the color choices but actually sway does all of that for you and does all of that quite naturally next slide please henry <coughs> chosen a convenient time to have a coughing fit in terms of sharing then um you can share sway in a number of different ways um, and actually you can share it with a link that's editable or also a link that can just be viewed. So actually when my children are working on a Sway, I give them an editable link. They're then all able to collaborate on the Sway. And then when we've shared it further, such as with parents, we've then shared the view only link. And the picture on the uh, right hand side there actually shows the post I shared on our school Facebook page about this time last year of the sway they've been working on remotely and it was really nice to be able to share it as that visual link and it raked up quite a few views actually lots of parents looking um, but a really good way of sharing and an easy way of sharing to a number of different outlets and different forms of media next slide please henry So you can embed a huge range of media within a Sway. And this is just an example of a form that one of my class did. Um, they'd actually had a couple of experiences of forms, but not a huge amount. And I tasked a small group of girls. We met on a call and we talked about how they would create a Sway, a, a form, sorry, to add into our Sway. And what they then did was they waited until the whole class had produced all their various bits on this Sway. And they then worked on creating their little quiz that they added as a form. This was just another way of my learner seeing the kind of real huge capacities that Sway's got and the different things they can add in. Since then, I've had children add little YouTube clips, particularly like when we've done science Sways, they've gone, do you know what, I need some more information or a diagram about this. They found a little clip that matches or perhaps a picture or all sorts of things that they can add in really just to add huge amounts of information that doesn't always have to be them typing it and then thinking it through actually they can find it to support the bits and pieces that they're giving next slide please mr p so this is uh, just a preview of this sway that my class did last year each group of learners worked on a different section some of those were sections that we'd actually learnt about in school prior to the last year's lockdown. Some of those were sections they'd learnt about at home. But you can just see the wealth of information that they were able to pull together on all the different aspects of their learning there. So it was just a really nice way of them having quite a nice takeaway from our unit. Lots of different research was taking place to do this. They worked out how to add in sections. Some worked collaboratively with a partner and they researched together and then they added that section. But just a really, really nice way of sharing a huge amount of information, amalgamating it all in one place. Um, and it's then been shared more widely with our parents, which is great. And next slide, Mr P. <laughs> so these are some previews of other sways that we've done within school. Um, the one first one, the life as an astronaut is actually one of our year five classes last year. They had, I think, three key subheadings and all the children contributed to the same sway. You've then got on the uh, left hand on the right hand side, sorry, the two on the Vikings and the Anglo-Saxons. I think they're from this year, year three and year four. Um, and I think the children were tasked, Mr P, you can correct me if I'm wrong, tasked on working on individual sways or small groups, individual, yeah, and small twos. So you can just see how far our learning journeys come with that as a school, because actually when we first started, we were looking at whole class sways or small groups so the children could upskill themselves. But as we've progressed, we're now looking at the children creating their sways independently and adding that information. And actually, I've found that lots of the time I've given children a choice and said, you can choose to present this using PowerPoint or sway or perhaps flipgrid and have top talking on there but actually children tend to go for sway because it does do the kind of formatting for them and they don't get frustrated when they're on powerpoint thinking this why isn't this lining up why isn't this working they lose that because actually sway does that automatically for them and they end up with a nice professional high quality document the one the bottom corner is again a whole class sway um my class collaborated to come up with some questions but it was just another chance to expose them to using sway in a different sort of format and a different context. And actually, they're going to do some of it this afternoon. They're going to be creating sways about in, in, important figures that have avoided persecution through crime and punishment this afternoon. So it'll be interesting to see how well they got on with that today. 
I think that's me done and I've rattled through it because I desperately need to go and get myself a drink. Um, I am actually off isolating, but I've been fine until this call, which is a bit ironic, really, um, considering Tim keeps messaging me, asking me how I am. I've been OK, um, but I'm going to go and grab myself a quick drink and then I will just pop back on. Tamara, you are amazing. I, and hats off to you joining during isolating the COVID. <laughs> that is going well above and beyond the call of duty. So thank you. Go get a drink. Uh, I've got a couple of things I was going to just pick up. Also, Tim, thank you for this constant content as well. It's it's so good to get the training videos or the insight into how it's being used in the classroom. It's so powerful to add that depth to what's already amazing sessions. So thank you everyone for this all round effort. I was going to pick up on the fact that there's been a lot of, of talk about how to use it for teaching and learning purposes, but also a number of schools we work with have found massive success with using Sways for other purposes. I'm sure you have at Cornerstone as well, whether it's moving newsletters to that format that go out to everyone and anyone, including parents, or using it to send things like trip information. And as uh, you've already said, it's so powerful for embedding other media, whether it's getting a video clip of the, of the centre they're going to be staying at, if they're going on a residential trip. And uh, in some of the other things that I found really inspiring is the the improvement in access things like you can add additional language tools in there as well so if you've got eal parents and, and pupils then that can really improve the ability to get into a newsletter where as it was a static piece of paper it may have been previously or a word document or a pdf it was harder to do that so there's again bringing in those other elements of office 365 what in what i was <laughs> just a general perspective i know when i first started to use it I loved it, but I think I was so used to life with PowerPoint and being able to twiddle with all the different functions on the ribbon at the top. I, I, I loved it and then I got frustrated because it's great as in you can make content really quickly and you can build it in from using it in a classroom situation that also avoids waste learning time with pupils. But I think as an adult, and I've come across this more with people like office staff teams that have gone, I just want to do this. And because a lot of it is choices made for you with choosing themes or remixing buttons and so forth, going in and changing fonts or colours, it's not impossible, but you just have to be open to doing it in a different way. And it's not like a word processor or something else. It, it can involve a little bit more of getting further down in and sometimes uncollapsing those cards and looking at the image in isolation or the text in isolation so far. But it, it is a great tool and I love it for that reason. And in the ability to link with other areas of Office 365 in, or embedding forms for surveys and having that as part of a newsletter or a staff survey going in there and in, in adding and enriching the information around what would be a form on its own. I've um, touched on a couple of points there. Um, I would say the factor of being able to embed Creative Commons pictures is really useful because that's the default search it does. Um, and actually something uh, for the children to understand that actually uh, sometimes they can't necessarily just take any old picture from Google. Um, and also, and I don't know whether Tamara and I, I don't know whether it was I that came across this first or I said to Tamara, why not you sway? And then she came back to me and said, Henry, um, was the fact that when you're editing a sway, uh, you can only have a limited amount of people at once. Uh, I think the limit is 10 uh, I think we said 13. I think we 13. Went 13 well, the limit. magic number. Um, uh, <laughs> but yeah, but make sure that if you're going to go away and try using Sway with your class, that actually you possibly have two or three Sways ready uh, that I know that certain, uh, that I know that year five and six have done um, instead of just having one Sway and that no one can access almost. <laughs> And I think I'd just come in, but the, the point you made there, Martin, about um, the, the, uh, the design of it, I think you're quite right. You, from a teaching and learning point of view, it's all about the content. It's making content accessible both to the person creating it and sharing it. And because it's online and it can be shared so easily, that's been fantastic. Um, and I think you, you sort of choose your tools. And again, I think you mentioned that tomorrow about saying, well, you can choose PowerPoint or you can choose where you can choose Flipgrid. You know, for us, a key part as a primary school is uh, helping the children learn all these tools. But when they get to year five and six, you want to say, right, this is what 
you want to try and achieve. This is the content you want to put. This is your real audience that you're trying to present to or share to. These are the range of tools. Which ones are you going to use and why? Uh, and actually, just as we as adults, you'd want the children to then be critical as well as creative in terms of choosing those tools. Uh, the other one, and I, I know I'm putting a lot in the chat, uh, any member of staff at Cornerstone will tell you that I just can't stop myself of sharing those things. But um, the last one I've just put in there, uh, again, Tamara was talking about it's a great way of collating lots of things. Um, so I've just put there an example, which was our showcase school application from back in the summer of 2021. So um, we had the interesting job of trying to put everything we'd done over 12 months uh, in one sway. Um, and uh, yeah, Henry kept saying to me, I think we need to reduce this slightly. It's a bit long still, Tim. Um, but I hope, you know, if you look at that as an example, um, the amount of different things you can put in there. And again, the way that you can use the content as a, a navigator. So you don't have to read all the way down. You can click on the three lines and you can choose which section you go to. Um, I'm hoping if you haven't seen Sway before, that gives you an idea of the, of the capacity within it. Just to pull up what you said there, Tim, about sharing, because it's so easy to share, actually, to give the children a real audience of like their parents or other classes is really, really easy because you can share it so quickly. You haven't got to spend a lot of time facilitating actually the process of doing that sharing. It's one click and it's gone to where you want it to go to. So that definitely, I think, raises the aspirations and the expectations of them because they know there is a real audience and a real purpose to the use of the sway. Absolutely. I think also the ability to embed. I know there's certain website platforms that are, are friendlier than others, but the the that you can use the embed link, you can get the embed code and you can integrate it with various website platforms that are used in schools. And that's extremely, extremely helpful for a lot of the schools that I've worked with that they haven't got to suddenly lock it and you lose the elements of what is a sway being interactive. It's alive. It's got clickable links. I think you lose it in my heart sinks whenever I whenever someone says to me, can you print it? I'm like, well, you can, you can. But if you print it, you lose the essence of what it is. What's the point? <laughs> yes. I almost I wish Microsoft would remove the print button so that it wouldn't function because it, it kills the joy of using Sway. OK, are there any questions from Tamara's session? And uh, while you're thinking about that, I just want to say again a huge thank you, Tamara, for limbering up during isolation and, and having a go at presenting this, because I know you can feel awful from having done the COVID thing myself. But um, thank you it's so much. It's because I've actually felt fine. And then I, I've chosen now to have a coughing fit, which is slightly ridiculous. Perfect. Right. Well, the next the next workshop that we have lined up is for Sarah. Now, I can see somebody has jumped on Henry's computer. Is that Sarah or do we need to take a slight break? That is, uh, Sarah. That is Sarah Martin. No, this is this is Sarah. Henry's slid away and I have slid in. <laughs> I thought this is going to be the quiz situation now. Who's just arrived on screen? That's brilliant. <laughs> Sarah. Are you ready to go or do you need a few minutes? We can um, we can all take a five minutes if we need to. Um, I'm good to go, but it's entirely up to you. I will just point out I am on Henry's uh, laptop, so I have got no option to go next slide, please, because it's all me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, Sarah, if you're ready to start, I think we'll carry on and we may end up with a slight gap after Sarah before we have the final one of these sessions because we're running a little bit ahead. But again, please do pop any questions you have in the chat because we're more than happy to talk around any of the things that people are sharing today. OK, fab, thank you. Right, let's see if I can do this then. OK, so first of all, um, my name is Sarah Southall. I'm the Special Educational Needs Coordinator and Early Years Leader here at Cornerstone. Um, and I'm going to have a bit of a chat with you today about our journey with Tapestry Online Learning Journal. Um, I put there the Twitter hashtags for you and the website address for anybody that wants to go and have uh, an explore after the session. Um, but of course, please do put any questions in the chat. I'll do my best to answer those for you. OK. 
So as a school, um, Tapestry enables us to monitor the coverage of the early years foundation stage curriculum um, and the depth of the children's learning within it. Um, Tapestry also has the capability to offer the same facility for the national curriculum and as such is used by hundreds of schools around the world. Um, I'm not on commission, I will just say that. Um, all the adults within my team um, can easily record and view learning outcomes and they have been taught that the sorry that um, the outcomes that have been taught and it also measures the depth of the understanding of the individuals and groups of children that have been taught this content. Um, they can do this by observations or using the quick and easy formative assessment tools within Tapestry. Um, here at Cornerstone, we are proud of the positive relationships uh, that we form with parents. Um, and that plays a really big part for us. Um, Tapestry gives us the opportunity to offer parents of the children in our care something special too. Parents are able to participate in the experiences that we offer here in school by us giving them regular access to photographs, videos and notes about their children. And at the same time, by investing in Tapestry, we have given ourselves a tool to help communicate with the parents, to monitor the progress against several educational frameworks and to organise the information we keep for every child. Now, for historically, for us, we would be printing lots of photos, we'd be sticking all this information into journals, we'd be keeping anecdotal notes on post-its and then something, sometimes having to rewrite them. And then we'd have to collate all of this information into some sort of coherent format ready for the parents at the end of the year. Um, so for us, Tapestry also has the added benefit um, of saving us lots of money and time on our, on our traditional scrapbook or binder file profiles that we would have done um, and with zero cutting and pasting, which is always a big win for my team. Um, at the end of our children's time with us, we give parents access to an electronic or paper version of the journal um, that we've been lovingly built up for them over the course of the year. Um, as a subscriber to Tapestry, uh, we receive a complete secure web application with its own unique address, as well as full viewing, editing and analysis controls. Uh, alongside this that runs in parallel, there's also a free downloadable iOS and Android app, um, which also enables parents to view the information we want to share, whether that be immediately or at our discretion, all of those are controls are within our power. Um, at Cornerstone, we really recognise that the first day of handing over your child to the care of another person can be an emotional time. Uh, whilst the children adapt very well to the experiences without parents, we know um, that parents know more about their child than, than any other and that as parents they continue to want to be a part of their child's learning journey. Uh, Tapestry facilitates this by enabling a personal journal or diary to be built over time uh, using photographs, videos and notes of special moments. Um, and they're not only recorded but can be made available regularly often, and often immediately to the parents. Um, Using the iOS or Android apps, parents can receive immediate notifications onto their phones or devices uh, or emails about new entries into their child's journal. Uh, and these can be celebrating the achievements or the day, of the day or any exciting activities that we've had going on, whether that be a fire engine visit or a trip to the, to the chapel within the school. Uh, and this can be individually or with their new friends and the staff looking after them. So you don't have to do separate observations for each child. You can do those as a group, which is also another way of us saving time. Um, Parents also have a positive part to play and can contribute to the growing journal by commenting on the journal entries that we make or they're able to add their own. Um, our families regularly upload pictures and videos of family events at home, whether this be a team effort on the home learning or pictures of a recent family holiday or just a weekend trip to the park. Um, but I will touch upon that later when I talk about um, something that we call tapestry time here. Um, the final part of the journey with uh, Tapestry is when our children leave their first year at Cornerstone. We will then provide all the parents with a copy of their child's Tapestry learning journal to keep and treasure as an electronic file or paper copy, um, as well as enabling parents to download and keep the videos that have given, you, given them the insight um, into their first independent experiences. 
Um, a, a child's tapestry journal can also be passed on to another school if they transfer to another setting mid-year. Um, I think our parents find that really beneficial. Um, and the fact that we make the, as a control, we are able to allow access of the parents into the system to download those journals. But obviously for those families that also don't have the technical know-how or provision to be able to do that, we are able to download it onto a system here in school. We can put it onto disk for them. So there's no prohibiting factors in the children receiving their journals at the end of the year. Uh, next slide. So I'm going to talk to you um, about the three main features of tapestry um, that we use here at Cornstone, which are the observations, memos and documents. Um, and these are just a few of the key features of tapestry. And we regularly use them um, and they have a positive impact on our children and their families. Um, using observation, tapestry builds that very special record of a child's experiences, um, both their development and their learning journey through their years and primary education. Uh, making use of photos and videos, our teachers and support staff and family members weave the story of how their children are growing and developing. And that is where the name of tapestry comes from. Um, the tapestry platform then works seamlessly to enable these memories to be kept as a permanent record of each child's unique journey. Uh, all information held in the platform is stored securely and can be downloaded and shared as required. Uh, information about tapestry is shared with our parents at the beginning of the year. Um, so they sign over to agree to us sharing observations for their children to be in joint observations. So from a safeguarding point of view, all the boxes are ticked. Um, and then as parents and carers, they are able to view their child's progress and the activities provided for them, how much fun they're having uh, whilst uploading their own comments and media. It also uh, allows the facility, should you have split families or families where two parents have parental responsibility but are not together, anybody involved with the child can log on and have access to the tapestry by providing the school um, with their email address. Um, this works quite well sometimes when we have grandparent carers um, so they're able to, to then support parents with that. Um, the communication between staff and parents that Tapestry enables helps build a shared understanding of how every child can reach their full potential from birth to the end of their primary school education. Um, the Tapestry online learning journal is also available as as the easy to use secure app, meaning capturing the key learning moments and videoing milestones are even easier. Just this morning, I've been taking pictures on my own phone to be able to upload onto Tapestry, but by using the devices I can also do, which I've got to do later this afternoon, is upload those onto the school website, onto Twitter and onto the school Facebook page in one blanket hit, which is really beneficial. Um, next slide. So observation, so here you've got on your screen on the left hand side is your window that opens up when you log into Tapestry. Um, observations are as easy as adding as clicking on the right hand button that says add observation. Um, and then you basically choose the child that you want to attach it to. You upload any photos or videos that you want to share. And then you can see there in the picture just before Christmas, and um, we brought our whole year, our cohort together to engage with a Chris Dingle activity led by Reverend Amy here at school. Um, and they had a great time. Um, and then you can see there the format of the observations. I can, as a manager, with manager permissions, I'm able to post directly onto Tapestry. For my support staff, all their observations can be set to be approved. So that means I have, uh, from a monitoring point of view, I'm able to check what's being said and how it's being said before it goes live to parents, um, which I know offers them comfort as well if they're new to the team or they're teaching and learning in new areas that they're not quite so confident with. Um, it, it gives everybody that professional recognition, but with the support if they need it. So staff, family members and children can all create observations and share them with each other. They can be used as a record of each child's learning and special moments. They provide a valuable insight of the child's home life for teachers um, and they're kept as a wonderful keepsake of their child's early education. Um, as I said, observations can include notes, videos, audio clips, pictures, uh, documents with clickable links. Um, and assessments of any learning that's been going on in the classroom. 
Um, they can be made immediately available to any authorised person, scheduled to go live at a later date, or simply saved in a draft form to be finished later. Uh, either way, you can make changes uh, that you want at any time to the observation without having to rewrite the whole thing. So for us, that's a really, really big uh, winner because it saves the time. Even when you're using the app, if you come out of the app and go back in, you can go back into exactly where you were because it's quite common for us to start an observation in the classroom and then something else happens and our attention is taken away for a short time. To know that we don't have to go back and start that observation again is, is really huge for us. Um, you can attach multiple children to the same observation, meaning that you can celebrate the grouped activities and the learning as well without having to worry about which children you've got in which pictures. Um, observations can then be organised by Tapestry's flag system or hashtags um, or, as well, or as well as general filters and can be linked to other observations, activities and reflections. Um, here at Cornerstone, we've created our own set of hashtags that link to the early years foundation stage curriculum and the development matters documents, which are our governing paperwork to dis uh, that describe how we have to deliver our provision. Um, and this enables us then to search for all the learning within a particular area of the curriculum. Um, we use this facility support to support us with moderation activities in and in place of book looks when we're collecting data and for ensuring equal coverage across the curriculum in all areas of learning. So, for example, we've just had um, we're just in the middle of doing a data drop at the moment and obviously we don't have books in year R. So I've logged onto the system with Tim and I've been able to show we can look at writing across a year group. We can look at writing across a class and then we're able to pull up particular children and look for particular areas of writing. So we use, for example, hashtags reading, writing uh, number. We also use hashtags for fine and gross motor development within the children basically means you're not trawling through hundreds and hundreds of uploads to get to the key information. It's right there at your fingertips uh, whenever you need it and what, for whatever you need it for. Memos. Um, so memos in a nutshell are an effective way to communicate with the families of the children in our care. Um, what you can see there on the left hand side is your dashboard of memos, which is basically provides you with a log of all the memos that you've sent and who that you've sent them to, whether they've been published or not been published. Um, and then uh, there at the bottom, you can see an example uh, of a memo that we've created. Um, creating memos to send to parents is quick and intuitive. Uh, we are able to include notes, clickable links to other web pages, media and documents. Uh, this means we're able to effortlessly effortlessly uh, direct recipients to specific online resources and attach things like PowerPoints, Word documents and PDFs all in one place. Um, as I said, we can choose which children are tagged and therefore which relatives can see the memo and we can easily cater the message to the group we're talking to, which I think is really important when we have a diverse range of parents and literacy, literacy skills within our cohort. Um, so, for example, on a day to day level, we send memos to all the parents each week containing the guidance videos and songs to support our phonics learning in the classroom. Um, we're also able to send group memos, for example, to those children who have forgotten to return their home learning books that week. Um, and we also send individual memos to children uh, about things like library books that have been forgotten. And the individual nature of that means that then I can target that particular memo to that parent, knowing whether it's a one off mistake or whether this is a uh, regular trend. But it also means I can give them particularly like the author and the title name of the book that they're actually trying to look for at home, which I know the parents find really useful. Um, only yesterday we had a child le leave a book bag behind and we were just able to drop them a quick note and say, not to worry, we've got the book bag here. Parents are always really responsive and pleased with the with the engagement and communication that we have for them. Um, the ability to schedule the memos to be sent in the future enables us to prepare memos beforehand, for example, in our PPA time, um, and then schedule them to send at the end of the week. So I have leadership time on a Wednesday afternoon. So during that time, I will download the learning for the phonics for this week and then I will schedule it to send at the end of the school day on Friday knowing by that point the children have had their full learning journey of phonics sounds for that week. Um, as with the other key features on Tapestry you can set the user permissions around what each staff member and relative can see and do with memos including whether they can comment on them or not. 
Um, memos need to be created via the web browser. There isn't the option to do that on the app at the moment. Um, but to be honest, we don't find that uh, prohibitive in, in any way. Um, if parents have email notifications set up, um, they will also be sent any text we add into the notes section as a direct email. Um, so everything that we want to communicate with parents for, um, is right there at the tip of our fingers to send them in one moment. I have come out, for example, of a PE lesson with several children who are not quite able to do their shoes and socks yet. And while the children are putting their water bottles away, I've managed to, to ping off that memo to those three or four parents um, at the tip of my fingers. And it doesn't it's not added to my to do list at the end of the day. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is documents. Um, <coughs> so the document feature here, what you can see here on the left hand side is a picture of all the documents that we have uploaded to Tapestry platform for our parents to be able to access. Um, the documents feature helps me and relatives and my team keep track of important information without the need for endless pieces of paper, which can get lost or become quite out of date quite quickly. Um, the documents we upload can be separated into folders. Um, as you can see there, for example, we have fine motor skills folders, we have home learning folders, we have particular folders for uh, isolation learning. Um, so they can be separated into whichever, whichever sort of bands that we choose. Um, and then they're automatically scanned for viruses when anything's uploaded. We can edit each file, its name and its description at any point. Uh, we can also choose on a file by file basis whether they are visible to relatives or just to staff. Um, there are lots of ways you might choose to use this feature and function of Tapestry. Um, but for example, we use it for sharing policies and protocols uh, regarding sort of fire safety, child protection, data protection, safeguarding with our families. We also use it for sharing planning documents. We use it for sharing resources with parents that they might use, like to use at home to support the learning that's been going on in the classroom that week. Um, from a day to day running point of view, we also use it to share dinner menus or uh, food items. For example, if we're doing tasting next week for Chinese New Year. So we will drop a document on there to show, to show all the parents the food that we'll be tasting. Um, and then if there's any allergy concerns, they can come back to us. Um, we also use it to share information about term days and holidays, but also, for example, if we're having a dress up day or an end of unit celebration, we'll do all of this by putting the information within our documents section. Um, so, as you can see, how you use the tapestry documents feature is totally up to you. Um, the features are built to be flexible, so you can use them in the way that works best for you in your school or setting. Um, I'm going to try and show you some examples now. So here what you can see um, on uh, the pits and pictures. So on the left hand side, you've got a little girl there. We were doing a unit of learning about uh, people that help us. So we were doing learning about the police. So I was able to upload a photo um, of what Sophie had been doing. Um, she'd been taking her fingerprints and then looking at the patterns within them. And I'm then able to share that uh, with the parents immediately. Go straight on there at whatever point in the day that it happens. We've got a little girl there when we had the first gym equipment out, we were able to share that as an exciting opportunity with the parents. But also from a learning point of view, you can see there on the right hand side, there's a piece of writing that we've done. So that's gone straight to Nathan's parents. They can see my, uh, my marking and my comments, but also I'm then able to give a little bit more detail that you can than you can get from that piece of paper and also provide a next step, which then means the parents and ourselves are all on this journey together. Um, and then parents, we do notice, do support at home, whether that be with reading or with writing or other curriculum areas. And also sometimes they'll come back and say, oh, oh for example, I noticed they've been struggling with that or oh, we've been really trying hard with our letter formation at home. And again, it just improves that communication and that dialogue with parents, because at the end of the day, we can't do anything without parents and ourselves all being on the same page. Um, tapestry time. I said I was going to touch upon this. So here what you've got are some family uploads with some quotes with things that parents have shared with us on tapestry. We've got a little boy there on the left doing his home learning, along with a comment that mum made while she was online. And then again, a little girl who had attended another child's party um, and then <coughs> was able to share that. So our parents engage so positively with Tapestry that we have to schedule in time each week to look through the uploads made by parents and carers at home. 
Um, the children love to see themselves on the whiteboard and to explain the story behind the pictures. Uh, the children talk confidently about their home lives and tapestry time facilitates an excellent real life opportunity to develop their speech and communication skills and an awareness of listener and audience for the others that are sat listening. Um, it's also another opportunity for the rest of the class to just see what's going on in other people's lives and what other people are, are talking about. And because obviously, because of the nature of the neighbourhood that we live in, it's really great if they, for example, that little girl there has gone to a very well-known climbing establishment in Whiteley. And it was then lovely for the other children to then be able to sit there and go, well, I've been to Rock Up, I've done that, I went that for there. And actually, that photo was taken from a child within the class, his birthday party. So then we had a really big conversation about birthday parties and celebrations. And we were able to link that to our learning prior to Christmas when we'd been talking about different celebrations. Um, so basically, it ties together ourselves with the children, with the parents and make sure that we're all on a unique joined up journey from the beginning of their time with us to the end. Um, that was a very, I appreciate I have spoken very, very quickly there to try and get through as much as I can with tapestry. Um, does anybody want to chip in or want to say anything? Tim, I'm not sure if you was anything that you want to add uh, because I am a bit of a tapestry expert. Yes, yes I, right. I don't generally do anything with tapestry. I leave it all to you, Sarah. So <laughs> yeah. I just keep quiet. <laughs> Sarah, I've got a question for you. If I can't see any in the chat, but feel free to throw something in the chat. I don't want to dominate this conversation. I'm always, I'm always really in awe of people that use tapestry or the other leading product that you can you can use to do something similar at early years, and just how comprehensive that documentation of everything that development of the child is in the way that it's captured. And almost my heart sinks a little bit of sometimes you can lose the way that you capture at that level as you progress through education. And it's great to see it yeah. celebrate and experiencing that uh, both from a teacher perspective, but also from a parental perspective perspective. And my children have both had tapestry, so I've used it to contribute and communicate with the school in the same way. But one thing I'm always really interested to know when we have events like this is how do you transition parents from tapestry into using teams further up the school how is that handled how do you facilitate that? are you able to speak about that and it might be that tim chips in here as well tim might, tim might chip in or henry might slide in sideways in a moment <laughs> um, but to be honest, i would i would say our biggest challenge is that actually we go from all singing all dancing in the era with this fantastic communication and then they transition to key stage one where the level of communication and type of communication with class teachers and the staff team changes. So I think it's preparing parents for that, but also supporting. So I still have really positive relationships with the class that I taught last year. So I'm able to facilitate them with that hurdle in their educational journey. Um, so once we've made that transition into key stage one, they then, the, the transition into teams is then somewhat easier because they've almost been drawn away from tapestry for a couple of years in key stage one. And then they're, they're put back into teams in year three for us here. I don't know, Tim, if you would say any different. I think it's, I mean, it is always a, a problem. And I think, again, it's that recognition that we go from an early years curriculum, uh, which is much more observation based and you're needing that close partnership with families to have the observations outside of school into a national curriculum, which is perhaps a little bit more uh, focused on, you know, reading, writing and maths, obviously the other subject as well, but that's slightly more academic, where perhaps more of the assessment, the majority of the assessment is coming from school staff. I think even before we used tapestry, even before we used Teams, it was every year there were a few families who struggled with moving from year R to year one, uh, just as there are a few children who go, what well, do you mean I can't? Uh, I won't say play all day, do child initiated learning all day. What, what's going on there? Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that, you know, we're pleased that's working well this year is that year three uh, are on Teams in one note. Um, you know, one of the things that we've talked to Microsoft about is, and I know a number of people have, is having a sort of simplified skin um, over Teams so that you could have a sort of a, a mini a Teamies, like CBB's version of it, um, that potentially could be a lot more accessible to year one and year two. But also, I think it's about, as, as Sarah said, it's about that partnership with the parents. It's about making sure that first year in primary is crucial, because if we get that wrong, it's very difficult to build those relationships from that. Um, and as you say, it's communicating and, and the communication is different in year one, too. 
So perhaps there is more focus on what we do a lot more through the reading journals, because actually there's a real big focus there on we want you to be reading daily. And this is what we're giving you a lot of feedback on more perhaps than, you know, whether they're tying their shoelaces or how they're climbing up gym equipment. And that's that's not say one is better or the other. It's just that natural part of a child development, but probably more, you know, school structures uh, and what we're trying to help the children learn and develop and what we're assessing them on. I think the other thing I would add to that is that I think by nature of our school set up at the moment, we are increasing the diversity within the children and the affluence in our local area. And I think that's something that we have to be really mindful of when we're using programmes such as Tapestry, making sure that those parents that ne haven't necessarily had the experiences before are still able to access these opportunities that we're offering them and whilst they might have lap might not have laptops or ipads at home it's giving them the reassurance that actually do you know what you can do everything that you need to do through your phone which everybody has got so in that in that way we can sort of overcome the affluence issue for us by doing that and i have had parents for the first time this year where i have had to go down that route and i think that's going to be an ever-changing situation for us here and it's making sure that we move with with that journey and we bring the parents on that journey with us too. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's something that, you know, has been recognised over the last two years, you know, um, that that digital divide in families, and we're not just talking you are them, what, whatever um, system you're using, actually, whether it's devices, whether it's internet connection, you know, it is really important that we don't let those become even bigger barriers to disadvantage for individual children and families. Um, and that we look, therefore, the key thing here is whether it's tapestry, whether it's a piece of paper, whether it's teams, it is that connection and that time invested with families that is so crucial. I can see that uh, Andrew's been inspired in the chat, so it's, it's good to hear. One other question for you is, and after I get this with people approaching using Teams, is that, that people find it a real barrier that at the moment there isn't a routine for parents to get into Teams like they would be able to contribute to Tapestry and, and get into it. How do you manage parents seeing their child's learning? Or Obviously, you, you've spoken about paper-based things like a, a reading journal and so forth, and I completely accept that. Do you do anything else to try and get parents to engage with teams or into teams? Do you encourage them to look over the shoulder of their child if they're using it at home when they progress up through the school? How do you manage that? I mean, again, it's certainly it's a there's that element of we've trained, we've offered training to parents so that they feel comfortable and they need to can access it. Uh, we've explained to them, you know, on a regular basis, reminders there that the children's home learning is there, that you can access it. And in fact, for year one and year two, we use OneDrive. We use a OneDrive folder within the school system. So again, we're trying to keep them used to there's somewhere online if you want to and if you can access it, but there's paper copies available if you don't. Um, in, in normal circumstances, which are obviously all trying to get back to this school year, uh, we also have events called open classrooms so that parents can actually come in and then they sit with the children and look at their books. Because again, you know, absolutely rightly, we do not want to be in a situation uh, where everything is done through Teams One though, you know, you want to have that balance, you want the children learning to handwrite, learning to draw, learning to use pencil and pen and paper as well. Um, and for us, you know, it's still the case that sort of 90% of what we do with the children is on paper and is in books. Um, and, you know, there's huge value in that as well. So there's there's that easy way of showing parents that when they come on those open classrooms. Clearly, it's been trickier. Uh, recently, we've tried to find points when we've not been on quite such a spike and still been able to do it. Um, and in fact, just this week, we were having a, a leadership team meeting where we were talking about, you know, we'll have some open air, uh, open classrooms. So it won't be necessarily the classroom, but the children come and get the books, take them out and look at them outside. But maybe we thought we'd wait till March rather than January for that one. Yeah, the only thing I would just add to that, which I think is a really fascinating thing that hasn't happened previously, is this year, obviously, in year one, we have the facility of tapestry. We also have class email addresses set up. So parents have two ways of contacting us if they wish to. However, they've obviously got siblings throughout the school. So I've had a parent who actually, despite tapestry and despite having a class email, has contacted me via their the siblings teams account further up the school and has searched for, for me through the directory. And then contacted me in that way. So I think it's it's interesting that we're hitting 
parents obviously feel sometimes more comfortable with some technology than others. Yes. Do you have an etiquette around that with parents? Do you ever express to parents, try not to use your child's account to communicate with teachers? Do you, or, do, or do you just let them communicate any which way they feel is relevant? Well, the majority of the time, we encourage parents to use the admin office email. Mm -hmm. um, and we try and filter as much through there as possible. But clearly, by having these other ways of doing it, um, I think, you know, one of the ways that we try to, if we feel it's sort of inappropriate or overuse of it, yes, we'll have a conversation. But then we've got um, a teachers to parents email and we'll reply back from that because they can't reply back to us. Uh, so if they know the reply is coming that way all the time, it's sort of all right, they can contact us. But if all the replies come back through a more formal anonymous route, mm. um, that works. But again, part of the conversation, I was having a chat with a uh, a parent the other day who was saying, oh, there's so many ways of communicating and I don't know which one's looking. There was this on an email and there's that on the website, but then there's this on Teams. And I was trying to explain, but yeah, the um, Teams is actually about us also communicating with the children. So uh, whether it's, you know, Tamara, uh, as she said, is um, self-isolating at the moment, but she's still posting to her class. She's still able to send individual chats or group chats because there's some of the children self-isolating as well. So again, it, it opens up those conversations without the technology wouldn't happen. And we had a, you know, we had a couple of really um, important examples, I won't go into detail, but important examples during January to March in 21, when we were officially on lockdown and schools were closed, even though we had about 50% of our children in, because um, they were all key workers, apparently. Um, but we had a couple of children who were having to uh, work from home, but had concerns regarding safeguarding um, and their safety. And normally in school, they would have said, can I have a word at playtime or lunchtime? They weren't able to do that, but they were able to send a chat message through Teams to their uh, teacher. Um, and therefore we were able then to, to take actions. Now that was only for you know year three to year six. So what about for the younger children? But again, I think this is also trying to say to parents, you know, Children at age four are different than age seven and different again than age 11. And obviously every year is it. And that, that growth, it's a real privilege working in primary school to see that growth. But actually how you want your fives and sixes using the technology will be a lot more independent. There will be times when we're communicating with the children, but you might not necessarily know. So, for example, um, digital leaders are, are doing a Monday Minecraft club with me at the moment. And there's various sort of conversations that we're having in a group chat that parents will be totally oblivious to. Now, from a safeguarding point of view, it's all within a school team. And therefore, I'm confident that should my chair of governor say, I've heard that these conversations are happening, you know, I want to see them because I'm concerned that you're perhaps being over familiar or over um, over communicating with this group of children. And I can say, well, yeah, here it is. And I've only done it through the school operating system. So again, if Sarah's applying through tapestry or if a parent contacts her through a child's team account, and Sarah actually replies through that, there is still that trail. It's still through a school system, and therefore it's also one we've still got control over. Completely agree. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Sid. No, yeah. <laughs> thank you both, I really appreciate that. Is there any other questions from anybody else before we move on to Tim's session? Again, we are running ahead, but uh if you're okay tim it seems logical just to move on yeah. okay if there aren't any other questions i'll hand over to tim and <clears throat> tim is going to be running a session all around forms surveys quizzes and assessments so tim over to you thank you very much uh so uh forms and we have obviously uh mentioned these uh earlier when Henry and I were doing uh, our session. Uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how we use them for teaching and learning, but I'll also talk a bit, if there's any uh, school leaders or office staff here, how we use them within the organisation. So as with a lot of the apps within the 365 uh, collection uh, and within the A1 licence, which are free, um, forms are really quick uh, to create uh, and really straightforward. It's quite intuitive. Um, so you've got uh, quick surveys, quick goals that can be created. Um, Fold you're not muted at the moment. Thank you for proving we have to keep an eye on technology. Um, 
But you can also, uh, particularly useful with the children, is creating quizzes that are automatically marked. Um, and so I've got some examples that I can show you. But again, I can tell you from a from a personal experience, um, I run a tutoring group after school on a Friday with year six, and we've used a number of these. And actually getting the engagement of the children, knowing that, yeah, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I can work at my own pace. And then it's going to tell me, OK, we've got this many right, I've got that many wrong. OK, I know the ones I can go and have another go at. Um, and they are motivated then to go back and try again with the ones they got wrong. Uh, whereas if it was a, you know, a traditional on a piece of paper quiz and it's right, I filled it in, I hand it in, maybe two or three days later, I get it back. But we've moved on in our learning. Uh, they're not so motivated to go back and correct. And what we've also found is it can be used really well. We do a lot of um, pre-assessments and post-assessments. So if you're doing I know, a unit of learning on multiplication and division, uh, particularly considering the last two years, we will often do a pre-assessment where we'll say, here's a series of questions. I just want you to have a go at this individually. I know where I hope you are on your learning journey, but let me just see where the class are, because it might be that some children who I think will be fine with this aren't, and it may be others who I think are going to struggle are actually better and further on on their journey. Um, so we can then inform our planning, we can adapt our planning, adapt the grouping, um, and then we'll often do the same one as a post-assessment, um, and we'll see, OK, so have they actually made any progress over these two, three weeks? And again, very deliberately calling them assessments or calling them quizzes. It's not a test. It's not a sit down for an hour in silence. It's about it informing the teaching and learning and informing the planning. So um, in terms of forms and the layout of them, uh, what you can see here is you can click on your uh, app launcher when you're in Office 365, and you can come down and find the forms icon. <clears throat> if you've got a school account, it's automatically set up to uh, give you a new quiz, but you can, if you click the drop down arrow, create a new form. So if you're doing a survey for parents, uh, you might just want to uh, ask for their information. You're not going to actually correct them or mark them on it. Uh, and then when you click on, whether it's a quiz or a form, you click in, you add a title, uh, you can add a description, which is particularly useful if it's a quiz for the children, because you can say, make sure all your answers are in pounds or make sure you're always rounding to two decimal points. Uh, you can also personalise it by putting in a picture here. And then you have a series of different question types. So you can go for multiple choice. Uh, and again, you could have that as just two or you could have it as a numerous number. I think 13 is probably the most we've gone to. I think there might be 13 on the feedback form for today's event. You can put in that actually you want a text answer back and you can put it either as a short or a long answer. You can ask for a rating. So it might be a one thumbs up to five thumbs up or it could be a date. So it might be OK, a historical quiz. What date did such and such happen? Or it might be actually on which dates parents would it be most useful for this to take place? You can do a ranking where you could give them a series of here are six options. Uh, what do you think would be most helpful? Uh, put them in ranking, reorder them with the top one being the most uh, appropriate. Uh, the like one is just a posh uh, name for a table. So basically you can have a series of statements down the left and then uh, rows across. You might have you know, strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, strongly agree. Uh, you can also have uploading files. So actually, sometimes if it's something, a project the children are working on, perhaps, and they've answered some questions, but they've also produced a Word document or a PowerPoint and they want to upload it, they can upload it. Uh, a net promoter score uh, just gives you a score between uh, zero and 10. So again, that's on our feedback form today. There's a couple of questions where there's grid from zero to 10 and it will just work out an average for us. And if you end up with a quiz or a survey, let's say with 50 questions, you might not want them to all appear in one go because it could be a bit off putting. So you might say, well, we'll do a section with 10 questions and then we'll start a new section. Um, and then it's not so overwhelming uh, when people are looking at it and working their way through it. So then you've got in terms of uh, settings uh, and sharing, uh, you can click on the preview and you can see what your form will look like both on a laptop 
or on a mobile device on a phone. Uh, and again, the bonus of this, a bit like Sways, is that it will automatically change its format to fit the device that's looking at it. And then you can click on themes. So they've got a, a range of colors. They've then got some suggestions of things you might put in. But what we tend to find is really helpful is this little plus here. You can then pick and choose one that is uh, personal to yourself, which is uh, makes it much easier. And it also, when you're looking at a whole load of forms, it's much easier. We often have like the parent forms all have a certain background. Staff ones have a certain background. And then that works really well. Uh, in terms of the settings here, you've got um, if it was a quiz, either you could show the results automatically or you could choose not to. Uh, you can also choose who can fill this form or this quiz in. So it could be if it was a quiz that I just wanted my class to do, <clears throat> I might say only people in my organisation can respond. So they'd have to be logged into our 365 uh, school domain. It could automatically record their name and it could automatically say only one response per person. So if I was being a bit harsh and saying you can't go back and have another go at it, I might put that in. Or you can set it to anyone can respond or you can say I only want a few people, so specific people. Uh, and then if we go across uh, to the share option over in share, you've got actually I can send this out and collect it and I'd like anyone to respond. Um, but there's also options further down where you can do a share it to duplicate. So again, I'll try and show you a couple of examples of that where other people can go, OK, I'm going to click on it, copy it, create my own version, and then I can adapt it. Or you can have a share to collaborate. So for example, the feedback form for today, I know I keep plugging it, but the feedback form for today, uh, Henry and I worked on together. Uh, so I created it, I sent him a link to collaborate, he then added some bits. So we were both working on it together. And when it comes to sharing, you can either share it as a link, you can share it as a QR code, or as we've uh, discussed when we were talking about OneNote, you can embed it, or you can do a direct email. Uh, so all of those are options in terms of sharing. And then in terms of responses, so uh, a couple of examples here. This one on the left, this is uh, our DTT meeting uh, for this time last year. So trying to find out from the team which is the best day and time for us to meet. Uh, you can see that there's a box here says questions, but I've actually clicked here on responses. So again, forms is quite straightforward because with the same uh, page in front of you, you can either go, I want to edit the questions or I want to look at the responses. Uh, we can see here we've got six responses, took everyone less than four minutes, so hopefully I won't get complaints. Um, and this form at the moment is active, so people can respond. Uh, I can review the results. I can review it as a, an overview, which is here, or I could click on here where it says view results, and I can look at the detail of every individual person's response. What is really, really helpful, and our office staff have absolutely loved this, is that if I go over here and I click on export to Excel, it will basically take all the information for that form and automatically put it into an Excel document in about three seconds, uh, which when you're collecting in sort of 200 responses from parents about a whole range of things is, you know, saves about a week's worth in the office, which is great. Um, and then over here, uh, the second example, again, I'm still looking at the responses, but this one was again, similar time last year, when we were actually surveying our year four, five, six learners uh, just, I think, before February half term and saying, right, we've been using daily Teams lessons. We've been using Teams and OneNote. Actually, how helpful has it been? How could we improve it? What would you prefer? What would you like us to keep? So we were able to create this survey. We then just posted it in the team. And even though most of the children were still at home, they were all able to click on and respond it. So it was a quick way of collating student voice, pupil voice, even though they were in lots of different places. Um, Mr. Penfold, there's a range of uh, links on the OneNote page. Um, if you'd like to share a few in the chat while I'm talking, because I'm unable to share and talk, strangely enough. Um, so here's just a, a few examples of how we've used it. Uh, and I'll just talk you through each one. So uh, top left here, where it says Fair and Gospel Common Closure Day. So this is a form that I've created. We've got about 
60 or 70 primary schools and infinite juniors in the Fairland and Gosport district. And on Friday the 18th uh, this year, so next month, we have what's called a common closure day. Most of those schools have taken the day as an inset day. Uh, most of those schools will then offer at least one or two free training opportunities uh, from staff that they've got who are particularly great at certain things. Um, and so what we've done is we've sent out this form and said, if you are having it as an inset day and you would like to offer uh, a training, can you put it on here? I then collated all those, popped it in a sway, and then when it came to advertise, it was out there. So again, what's great with forms is it's not just about within your school. Um, I was able to quickly collate responses from 60, 70 schools with me doing very little work and taking very little time. Uh, the next one along, uh, really love this example. So we've got a group of our year sixes who were very keen to run a, a lunchtime art club for years three and four, uh, really passionate about art. And we said, OK, that's great. How are we going to decide? And actually, the children went, well, if we did it as a form, could we pop that link into their class team and they could respond? It was like, absolutely, we can definitely do that. So that's children using it to gain uh, feedback from children. Uh, this is the one that I was mentioning earlier. So we had over, we had about 220 responses uh, from parents this year for all the permissions for things, any allergies, any medical issues. As I say, we sent out the link three weeks later, you've got pretty much all the responses. Click Excel, document is there. Uh, but we also use it for staff surveys. We're using it this year. We're doing uh, looking at children's well-being and looking at how we can help develop it, um, as we have obviously over the years. But we're using a particular sterling well-being scale this year. And so we're doing <clears throat> a survey with them in autumn term, another one this term and another one in the summer, so we can compare that data. <clears throat> and another one we did, uh, I mentioned earlier on this morning about us creating these on-demand learning videos. Uh, for parents and so again it was a way of getting feedback staff are putting a lot of time into it uh, creating these and we wanted to know uh, whether parents were finding it valuable or not um, this is what um, some of them will look like so when you click on them uh, you can hopefully see how they've been personalized uh, so um, this one here the school school dog permission so sarah who's just been talking to us has a, a beautiful uh, Labrador, who's now just coming up to a year old, uh, Wilson, who's now the school dog, but we obviously needed parents' permission uh, that the children, their child could interact. Uh, here's the year three, four lunchtime club. Uh, as you can see, the children have had a go at creating, using the same picture there with the title, but also as the background to try and make it stand out for the other children. Uh, we've used uh, the school logo as a background for things here, like prospective family tours. But then here we've used the school logo as the picture, just on a purple background uh, for tours for prospective um, new member of staff. And then this was uh, just something we've been working on recently. So these are some of the quizzes uh, that we've created and we've uh, created a range for year two to year six. Um, and our aim is that we will be uh, sharing these, or we are sharing these, the, the links there, Mr P, if you're right to share that one now, that'd be great. Um, so we're sharing these uh, so that other schools can duplicate them. Um, and what we're asking is if you do duplicate it and create your own, could you then share them back so that together we can start creating uh, a bigger bank of resources, uh, which would be uh, really fantastic. So I think, yeah, I'm just going to jump back because I'm going to stop presenting and then reshare, hopefully. Uh, to give you a little bit of a demo. If I can find the correct. Come in here, so I'm hoping that you can all see my uh, forms here. Uh, yes, we can. lovely. Thank you. So um, and I'm just going to reload that because I know we've had more than four responses. So thank you. We've got eight responses to our feedback. Um, uh, it's just, I think, useful to see examples. Um, so we've got here the feedback for today. We've got our DTT Spring 22 meeting. This one is prospective new families tours. So if I show you, if I click into this one, uh, you can see that we've got, uh, I'm looking at the questions at the moment. I put a title, I put a little bit of information, but try not to make it too much. And then it's just really quick. It's a 
name of the parent carer, so that's a text box, uh, contact phone number, name of your child, date of birth of your child. I'm specific about how I'd like them to give it. And then this is just an example of a multiple choice, so they can just tick. Uh, so it's going to take them about a minute or two to respond. And as you can see this year, we've had 76 people respond. If I was to click on preview, this is what it would look like if it was on computer. If I looked at it on a mobile, it would look like this. So as I said, it automatically adapts. Uh, I mentioned before about the theme. So if I clicked on theme here, I could pick one of these colors. I've obviously chosen the school background. Over in settings, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, the three dots, you can click on settings. So over here, I put anyone can respond, but you can also say, I'm gonna set a start date and I'm gonna set an end date. Because if it's something like uh, a survey for parents and you're saying we want to live by Friday the um, 28th of January, uh, obviously tomorrow, you can set it as an end date and then it will automatically close. What you can also do is customise your thank you message. So I've just put here hopefully a nice welcoming message so that when parents do sign up, they think, oh, isn't Mr. Clark lovely? He's even so quickly written back to me and said, thank you for doing that. Uh, maybe not realising that it does it automatically. Um, and as I said, with the share option, we've set at the moment that anyone can respond. I could have chosen only people in the organisation, but that would be a bit foolish for this one. Um, and if I wanted to collaborate, which I do, uh, actually, I've got people in the office team um, who are, and Sarah's year are, who are also able to view this and edit it. So if a parent phones up the office and says, I think I've uh, booked a meeting or booked a tour for this date, but I now can't make it the office staff can get in and see that as well. But the other one I wanted to show you uh, was this, an example of this one here. So this is the uh, reasoning fractions decimals. So this is one of the quizzes we've created for year six. Um, again, what we've got here is the series of questions. So you've got text one here. Um, at this one, because it's just your name, no, you don't get a mark for it. Hopefully you would know that already but it is required. So you can set questions to either be optional or required. And if I wanted to add a new one here, it's really quick. I just click add new and there's my choice that we should, saw earlier. Uh, so that's the sort of layout. But what you can then see is because it's one where, oh, I've needed to actually add in pictures. If I click on this, um, there's actually a little picture uh, icon. So you can add in a screenshot or a picture as well as text. And as you can see here, there's a space for the children to answer. And I've written in what the correct answer is. And I've said it's worth one point. That means that every time a child does it, if they type in that answer, um, they will get that point. And you can see here, I've tried to be clear, type your answer in G grams. So hopefully they'll get it because if they just write 90, forms won't recognise it. Uh, now, again, when it comes to uh, previewing it, there it is on a computer. There it is on a mobile. So again, if a child was doing this for home learning and they didn't have a device at home, actually they can still see it, they can still access it and they can still answer it. So that doesn't necessarily stop them. One of the new things that they've done in forms literally in the last few months, because if I was to um, click show more and then scroll down and click show more and then click down and show show more, you can see that I ended up with a very, very long list and it's quite hard. I've tried to colour code them to make it easier, but it is quite overwhelming as you create more forms. So one of the things they've done recently, which has come back from user voice, is they've created something called collections, which is so, so helpful. So here we've got all of our year two quizzes in one collection, one folder, year three, year four, and then further down here, we've got anything to do with digital cornerstone, anything external, anything to do recruitment, and you can see it there. If I wanted to create a new collection, I just click new collection, give it a name and it will appear. And then if I was in a particular form, I can click on here and I can say, I want to move this to this collection or this collection, or it's in the U2 collection, I want to remove it from that one. So that's uh, literally happened in the last few months, uh, but has been really, really helpful uh, for us as staff. So, that is sort of uh, my input on forms, which I hope is helpful. Um, if there is any questions that anyone would like to ask, 
I will now be able to stop talking and, and hopefully take those questions. Great, thank you, Tim. No questions from me, but has anybody else out there got anything that they haven't popped into the chat that they just want to ask? Uh, I think one thing touching on what Tim was saying, you can do that really annoying thing with a form and make it a required answer. Uh, you may have noticed that when Tim was sharing and demonstrating about forms, that you can have the red star, that really annoying thing that when you're trying to really quickly fill out a form and then you haven't filled it quite all in, um, which is obviously really useful because then actually for us as a school, then we're actually getting all of the information uh, fed back to us. And actually another thing I forgot to mention, which I should have done, we mentioned about immersive reader being in OneNote, but immersive reader is also in forms. So again, if you've got a child who's struggling, is really good perhaps at the maths, but is struggling to read it all, they can open it in immersive reader, hear the questions, read them, and again, still access it. Any questions from anybody? I think that's a massively comprehensive session there, Tim. <laughs> I, I did do my best. <laughs> I think Microsoft would be extremely proud. You should just go in and advertise it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you covered all functions. OK, if there isn't, then it means that we can have a slightly longer pause between the end of this session and the beginning of next, which is probably welcome for a lot of people just to go stretch legs and wander around. So we are aiming to join back up at two o'clock and I'm just going to share a different link a minute um, and steal the session. So at two o'clock, we will move on from classroom masterclasses and we will go into having a guest speaker. The guest speaker is Sean Phelps from Hable, but he's also previously from Microsoft and spent a number of years there. And he'll be talking about accessibility in the classroom. Tim and Henry, did you want me to share the redeemable code at this point that you've you've passed over? Yes. yes, that'd be great. Thanks, Martin. OK, so there is a code associated with the classroom masterclasses that you can redeem in the MEC or the Microsoft Learn Education Center as it will be coming. It's on screen now. We'll also post it into the chat for you so you can get a copy of it. If you sign into the Microsoft Learn, or the Microsoft Education Center, because it works on both at the moment. You can go redeem the code and then you'll be able to get your credited with some custom learning. It will equate to a thousand points and you'll get your MIEE status, not your MIE, so your MIE status. You have to work a little harder to get your MIEE. Uh, we'll leave that on screen now. I'll pop it into the chat, but we're going to have a break and then we'll reconvene for Sean to begin at 10 past two. So there's a chunk of time now to go away and do what you need to do and then come back. I'll leave that on screen. I'll also post the code in the chat so you can copy and paste it out and just check in before we all head off for a little bit. Are there any final questions? No. OK. All right. Well, thank you, everyone in Cornerstone side. It's been an amazing lunchtime session. And can you pass on thanks to the staff as well? That is immense as to the amount of content you've covered, the skills, the insights, it's just so great. So thank you for everything there and we will come back together for a 10 past two restart. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you.